on Oakman and Ewall Circle. This was, this was Eddie Back Cave. This is where he used to spend all his time at, most of his time with at Fair Lee. She was the first person that got caught a case with him. She got busted in New York on the airplane. And like I say, you understand, they damn near tortured that woman, you understand, tried to get her to talk on him, and she never did give, she never did break. You understand, like she used to send mail to him, and they would stop all his mail coming to her from Eddie. They were trying to make her think that he, would, he just had forgot about her. And I'm talking about everything they did to her, you understand? She still didn't break. She didn't say a word about Eddie, you understand? Fair Lee was one of the strongest ladies that you ever seen in your life, you understand? The only thing I hated about the whole operation was when she got out of jail, he didn't set her, out, set her up the way he should have, you understand? Because she was a real stand-up person. Fairly. I used to take her mama to see her, you know, see her, you understand, when he was when she was locked up in Virginia. You understand? Fairly just died a few years ago. But Fairly, you understand, was a straight person, you understand. I used to come over here, you understand, and drop Eddie off like on a Friday, and he might stay there until the next Friday, you understand? You know, and anything they need, I made sure somebody bring whatever they need. You know, and like I say, I was making all the trips out of town, you understand? And like I say, I was the mule. I was the one, you understand, going to New York copying, bringing it back, cutting it, and dropping it off. And I would make two trips a week sometime, you understand? Before I get back to Detroit, the shit be sold before I even get back, you understand? And like I say, you understand, but like I say, I had protection all the way from to get out of New York. When I got in, uh, when I got ready to go over to George Washington Bridge, I was on my own then. But other than that, you understand, you understand they made sure, you understand, I was protected. I didn't have no problems with the police or nobody, you understand? That's the kind of protection they had on us. And they loved Eddie. They loved him, you know? And like I say, you understand, he was one of a kind, Eddie Jackson. Now, now I, I remember uh, they were talking about one of the five families. Do you remember what, which of the five we was, families? We was, we, was, we was dealing with the Gambino family. Gambino. That's who we was dealing with. Oh yeah, Doc and Bruno. Right, right, right. And any time Eddie had any problems with them, I was the one to go up in New York and let them know what was going on. I'm talking about I'd have been in some heated arguments with them, you understand? But like I say, you understand, hey, one thing I loved about Eddie, he ain't asked nobody that was in our organi organization to do anything that he wouldn't do. That's one thing that I loved about him. He didn't feel like, you understand, he was too good to do anything. Eddie had more heart than any guy you ever seen in your life and didn't take no shit. <laughs> One night at the Thunderbird Hotel, uh, Frank ran into Eddie Jackson and Courtney Brown, who were the two biggest dealers in Detroit, and they struck up a conversation. And this black guy standing at the table, he got a pocket for a handful of money, gambling. Eddie sees him over there, and he don't know who he is, and he said, what is he betting on? And he said, I'm betting against it. And then finally the guy said, hey, homie, where are you from? I'm not for sure what year it was. I think it was 1973 or 1970. No, I think it was 1973. 73. Uh, that's when uh, we all got arrested in Vegas around Christmas time, because every Christmas, you understand, all the big drug dealers and number men would be out there in Vegas. And he said, I'm from Detroit. And he said, I'm from New York. He said, my name's Frank. Frank Matthews? Yeah, man, you know me? No, but we got some mutual friends that know you. But like all drug traffickers, eventually the party's over. No matter how far behind law enforcement is, they eventually catch up with, with the bad guy. Matthews was in Las Vegas uh, during the first few days of January 1973, and at this time, an indictment came out in New York against him. Next morning, 
Las Vegas headline. New York Kingpin, Frank Matthews arrested with $25,000, girlfriend, so forth. In this particular year, you understand, the feds, they round up every drug dealer in Vegas. And we got locked up in the cell. It was me, Courtney Brown Sr., Eddie Jackson, and Frank Matthews. Uh, he was arrested in um, Las Vegas by local DEA agents. The judge leveled a bond of $5 million, which was unheard of at the time. It was the biggest bond in history. The $5 million bail was the highest uh, at the time uh, established for, for a person in the United States. Which, if you were to level that bond today, it'd be $30 million. Matthews, when he was arraigned, said, how am I going to pay that? And the IRS agent said, preferably in cash, Mr. Matthews. And like I say, that's the same year that he was uh, he, he left the country. And like I said, we all was in there for about a whole day together. That was the first time I ever met Frank. And we, we did a lot of talking that day. And, you know, and like I say, you understand, after that, he was just like a ghost. And it was all over the news about a major drug dealer who was captured in Las Vegas. And then I started getting phone calls from people. I got phone calls from my parents in Florida. I got phone calls from friends who knew, did you hear, did you hear, turn on the radio? And it was him. And my first reaction was I was disappointed because I wanted the job. <laughs> he gets down to Clark County Jail. There's Frank Matthews. Goddamn homie, they got y'all too. Yeah, I said, yeah, I said, man, why you telling you it was hot? What were some of the things you talked about? We just talk about, you understand, why the feds always, you understand, try to lock, you understand, black people up, you understand, because they're handling money, you understand, because we were, all of us had money, and we was all out and losing money, you understand, $100,000 was nothing to lose, and like I said, he probably would have lost way more money than that, and I come to find out who he really was when he was in jail, you understand, at that time, you understand, far as my knowledge, he was big, bigger than Eddie. Big fish. Yeah, he was a big one. You see, he was way bigger than Eddie. Because this man, you understand, he was getting shit directly from South America. You understand, he had had the whole East Coast, you understand, where he was supplying. Frank was a big friend. He was a big, big uh, uh, fish. And uh, him and John Claxton is the only two guys that I ever know, you understand, that was wanted, and ain't nobody never seen them since. And John Claxton was the guy that Eddie started to copy from. That's where Eddie started making all his money, you understand, before he got with Because when he got with he already was rich. And he got that, you understand, he made that money from John Claxton. You know, and John Claxton had been already locked up. And when he got out of jail, Eddie was telling him, man, you got to change things. You can't do it the same way you used to do it. And he just wouldn't listen. And he ended up catching another case and have nobody seen him since, John Claxton. Disappearing now. That's right. All right. I called him, I didn't get no answer from him, so I called the bar to find out was he still there. So I pick up the phone, they pick up the phone, I ask him where Ola said, I hear a lot of commotion in the back. People hooping and hollering and crying and shit, so I hang up the phone, I, they hang up on me and I called back. When I called back, they asked who I was, they, I told them who I was, and they told me that Otis was up there on Six Mile and, oh, and Davis and Wilbur. I mean, Wilbur didn't, well, Davis and Wilbur. time to really tell a great untold Detroit story because it kind of covers Detroit at its at its zenith. Very interesting story. We decided that we were going to make a movie. All right, Rich Rossi with you and with Motown Mafia. I'm with Courtney. Lewis Stevens. Lewis Stevens, Courtney. Brown. Uh, Courtney Brown Jr. And uh, Alan Al Prophet Bradley. And this is an entrepreneurial, inspirational story too because again, you know, I'm a real estate retail guy. You know, that's what my skill set is. Um, but I'm a businessman, so I was like, you know, we just, we're gonna do it. You know, sometimes when you got a dream, you won't have all the answers on how you're gonna do what you're gonna do. But what made this one unique was not so much 
the crime, but the intertwining with Detroit's history and the Motown era and kind of the economic decline of Detroit. And it's really the story of uh, a family. And from some perspectives, it's has a happy ending, like you said. For others, it didn't have a happy, <laughs> happy ending. Right, right.